Welcome to AFTD's educational webinar series. Today's webinar is Behavior Variant FTD Subtypes, Divergent Anatomy, Divergent Behavior, presented by Dr. Katherine Rankin. I'm Sharon Denny, the Program Director at AFTD. On behalf of all of us here and Dr. Rankin, we're delighted to have you join us today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate in today's event. Dr. Rankin will present her information in two parts. Following each part of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions. We ask that you submit your questions by typing them into the questions section, which lo is located towards the bottom of your control panel. Please send your questions as you think of them, and we will ask as many as possible at the end of each section. We will have you muted for the duration of the presentation so that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. This helps to keep the background noise to a minimum so everyone can hear the presenter clearly. If you're having any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box, and either Bridget Moray and McCabe or I will try to answer your questions without interrupting our guest. Today's webinar is scheduled for one and a half hours. We will be recording this, and we'll post it to our YouTube channel and website in coming days for those who missed it or for people who want to revisit it. For those of you who are meeting us for the first time, AFTD is a national nonprofit organization whose entire focus is on FTD disorders. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for people affected by FTD and drive research for a cure. We do this every day through advancing research, awareness, support, education, and advocacy. AFTD offers an ever-growing array of specialized information and support for people diagnosed with FTD, their families and friends, and the professionals that serve them. This includes our website, a companion website for children and teens of someone with FTD, and the only helpline in the country devoted to FTD, where each call and email is answered individually by a specially trained AFTD staff member. Our Comstock Travel and Respite Grants provide direct assistance to help people attend an FTD conference or to use respite to recharge. Our newest initiative is a national network of affiliated FTD support groups, which provide group leaders with education, support, and networking with peers. If you're interested in any of these opportunities, please let us know via our helpline, and staff will get back to you to discuss them further. Before beginning our presentation, we want to highlight a few things that are new on the horizon here at AFTD. Our educational series brings expert to you, experts to you to address important aspects of FTD care and research. The next installment will be on August 24th with Dr. Diana Wheaton, the director of the exciting new FTD Disorders Registry. We'll be sending more information out about this shortly. AFTD's 2017 Food for Thought campaign is right around the corner. For two weeks spanning the end of September and the start of October, we will celebrate FTD awareness with events in all 50 states. Please consider sharing some food and your story about a loved one affected by FTD while raising awareness and funds to support AFTD's mission. For more information, please contact our grassroots coordinator, Bridget Graham. And finally, our 2017 education conference in Baltimore earlier this month was the largest and liveliest yet. The next one will be Friday, April 13th in Chicago. Visit our website for materials from past conferences and upstate updates about the Chicago event. We hope that you can join us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Katherine Rankin. Dr. Rankin is a neuropsychologist and professor in the UCSF Department of Neurology and the Memory and Aging Center. She specializes in the neuropsychological, neuroanatomic, and genetic underpinnings of human social and emotional behavior. Her research analyzes structural and functional brain images to examine the neural basis of empathy, theory of mind, personality, and to understand the social signals for sarcasm and deception. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Rankin to help us understand the diversity among clinical presentations of behavioral variant FTD. Thank you, Sharon, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm getting my slides up right now. I hope everyone can see them. Uh, 
Thank you so much to Sharon and to the AFTD for inviting me to do this. I actually uh, really am excited about this format because I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and answering your questions. Um, as Sharon has mentioned, uh, this is an hour and a half program and our plan is actually to have me speaking in two parts. So I'm going to start uh, by talking about how dysfunction in specific networks in the brain cause some of the behaviors that we see in FTD syndrome. And I'm going to talk about the diversity that we see across FTD patients uh, because of these differences in anatomy. Then we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A session where I'm going to answer questions that, uh, that you give to the organizers. Then we're going to do another section where I'm going to speak. And in that section, I'm going to get into more detail. I'm actually going to talk about the brain anatomy that helps us to uh, conduct social and emotional behaviors in our real lives and how those change as a result of behavioral variant FTD. And then at the end, we're going to have a nice long section for Q&A. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to those Q&A pieces, and I'm, I'm hoping that you all are sending in your questions. So to get started, I know what we're all here to think about uh, is FTD and how FTD causes the changes in behavior that we all see as, as part of this disease. And to think about this, uh, I want us to think about uh, the way the brain works. And to simplify that, I have a map here of the United States road system, sort of some of the main roads that are in the United States. And if we think about the way the brain works, uh, we have so many different connections in our brain. So many different neurons are connected to everything else. And if you were going to say, you know, how do you get from from, say Chicago to uh, San Francisco, there are probably literally millions of different ways that you could do it. You could go on so many different roads because everything's connected to everything else. But we don't tend to do that. It's one thing to say there are structures, roads that are connected. It's another thing to say how often is each road traveled. And when we think about it, really, if you were going to go from Chicago to San Francisco, you would take probably one of a couple of different main roads. And that's actually exactly the way that the brain works functionally. Um, we tend to take certain pathways and certain activate certain circuits in our brains again and again and again because it's the easiest way for our brains to work. And when we talk about networks in the brain, we're really talking about these superhighways where function uh, of our brain, the degree to which two structures or a network of structures is connected really shows us how we're going to behave and the ability, our abilities to perform certain cognitive behaviors are dependent on how, how strong these roads are, how well kept they are, um, how direct they are. And so this is really an important foundational concept when we think about BBFTD and I think some of you have probably heard this if you've, you've learned a little bit about the science of FTD, uh, but Recently, in the last uh, five to ten years, we've realized that the way that FTD happens, there are particular networks in the brain that tend to degenerate. And we've learned a lot about what those networks are, but we've also learned a lot about how those networks work in all of our brains. This is actually a normal function that we have these networks, all of us have them. Um, what I'm showing here is I'm showing that when we look at normal brains, we can see that certain structures in the brain tend to, if we were looking at the functions, they put somebody in an fMRI machine and just saw how things were, uh, were happening, certain structures, even if they're far apart in the brain, tend to activate and deactivate together. And they tend to be kind of wired together in the brain. It's not just that they are connected, it's that they function together. And when we look at different syndromes of neurodegenerative disease, uh, Bill Seeley figured this out in 2009, and it was a major breakthrough in our field. We see that these different disease categories, Alzheimer's disease, behavioral variant FTD, semantic variant, uh, prog primary progressive aphasia, uh, cortical basal syndrome, these are each of these syndromes, when they start, they hit certain regions of the brain, and we have volume loss in those regions, but it's different from disorder to disorder. They're very different. And what Bill figured out was that these patterns of volume loss match the networks that are present in normal, healthy people. 
And so what we realized was that each of these syndromes preferentially hits one of these functional networks. And each of these functional networks actually has a, a, a particular thing that it does. So for Alzheimer's disease, the parts of the brain that are structurally hit and then also in healthy controls, what uh, healthy people, all of us, um, what happens is this is the, the memory network or the default mode network of the brain. So Alzheimer's disease hits the functional network that affects memory. Um, if we look over here, CBS is, a, is sort of a motor disease, among other things, and it hits a motor network in the brain. These language disorders hit language networks. And this is where it becomes really interesting. We realized that for BBFTD, there's a particular network that gets hit that we had never really looked at in healthy people before. And that's the network that we call the salience network. And we realized that if this network, taking down this one network was all it took to make somebody behave like a VVFTD patient, then this network was really important for us to be able to have normal uh, social and emotional behaviors. And so we really started to look at this network. It's called the salience network. Um, it gets it's the very first thing to, to go wrong in BBFTD patients, and it explains a lot of their symptoms. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this, particularly in the second part of my presentation today. But the thing that the salience network is doing is particularly interesting. You would think, oh, it, it helps us read emotions and know social uh, norms. And you'd, you'd think it would be doing a whole lot of things in social cognition, but it actually has a more simple function. And when we look at what the salience network is doing, it's actually helping us to orient our attention to what is important for us. It's orienting our attention to what is what we say scientifically is homeostatically relevant, uh, or in other words, relevant to our safety, our health, and our survival. So this network probably evolved so that if we were focused on one thing, like say I was peacefully sitting in a clearing weaving a basket, I'm very focused on my basket and what's happening with that, but if a tiger jumps into the clearing, I need to immediately recognize that the basket is no longer important. The tiger trumps the basket and I need to go you know, run away uh, and do a lot of other behaviors to try to make sure that I survive. Um, but this network is more than just survival, it actually is more subtle. And we are social beings. We humans really are embedded in our social environments in such a way that for us to survive and to thrive involves connection. If I am, you know, really rude and insulting to my boss, I might lose my job, and then I might actually not be able to support myself and my family, and that has survival relevance for me. Um, if I go on a date and I don't know how to handle myself, uh, I'm maybe not going to get a second date, or I might maybe going to fail to pair bond and have children and all those things. So these are all, you know, our social interactions matter how we treat people in our social environments has survival relevance and it has safety and health relevance. It helps us maintain adequate social status and support. And you can imagine what happens when this network that helps us know how to avoid punishment and know how to seek out reward and know how to pay attention to other people's social signals and value those, if that network goes down, all behavior changes. So. I'm showing you a very complicated slide here, um, but this is sort of placing in context the networks that are affected in many uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and all of these are intrinsically connected networks, like I explained. Um, but the network that is focal in FTD is the salience network, and I would place this network straight in the middle of uh, the ability to care about what happens around you, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a little while. And this is always considered the key network that goes down first in BBFTD. However, you can see there are a lot of other networks on this slide involving perception, other networks involving caring, and other networks that are about planning and control. What do you do with information once you decide to pay attention to it? And it turns out that a lot of those networks can be affected in BBFTD. Only they're divergently affected. Some BBFTD patients have damage to one network but not another, and the different combinations of networks make a huge difference in behavior. And this is where the diversity is coming from. And this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more today. So I, we started to see this, and we've certainly seen this across our FTD patients, but I wanted to 
take another closer look at it. And I worked with uh, Kamalini Ranasinga, who is uh, a fellow in my lab. Uh, she and I were looking at work by Jennifer Whitwell that came out in about 2009. Jennifer Whitwell took a, a large set of BBFTD patients and looked at the volume in their brain and just said, well, some of them have right temporal volume loss and some have right frontal and some have both. And, you know, she basically did a mathematical technique called cluster analysis and used those, those structures in the brain, volumes of lobe, different lobes, to divide up FTD patients. And we were thinking, that was before we really thought about FTD in terms of networks. It was before we realized that intrinsic connectivity mattered. And so what we decided to do, Camelini and I decided we were going to redo this, but we were going to actually use the networks in the brain. And we were still using structure, but we were only using structures that were specific to these networks. And so we used about, uh, we had included in the study about 90 BBFTD patients. And uh, what we did was we looked at some of the different networks, salience network, of course. We also included networks called the semantic appraisal network, which I'm going to describe a lot in a lot more detail later, the default mode network, and the executive control network. And it turned out, without going into too much detail about the math, it turned out only the first two, the salience network and the semantic appraisal network, were of any value in dividing up the FTD patients. So we took out the DMN and the ECN. Um, and uh, again, without going into too much detail, when we did a, a, a principal components analysis and a cluster analysis, this is how, just by putting an anatomy into our models, this is how BVFTD patients divided up. You can see that they really divided into four distinct groups. And then when we actually took those four sets of circles, four distinct groups, we didn't know who they were or what they looked like yet. When we did an anatomic analysis of each of them separately, we got some very interesting results. So when we took that cluster, those clusters and divided them into BBFTD subgroups, we saw that there was one subgroup, and we called it the salience network frontotemporal group, which had a lot of frontal damage bilaterally and a lot of temporal damage bilaterally. There was a second group that we call the salience network frontal that really didn't have nearly as much temporal damage. Now, they still had the salience network damage, so the medial, you know, inner parts of the temporal lobe are still damaged, but you can see here that there's a real difference in the rest of the temporal lobe between this first type and the second type, and that's going to be important in a minute. A third type we found, and this was actually, this type has been described before by others, uh, but we got it out just mathematically, is a type we called the semantic appraisal network type. They're very much temporal without much frontal damage at all. And the temporal lobes are very important for this type, and I'm going to describe why. We also got a fourth type that was really a surprise to us. When we, when we clustered the anatomy this way, we got a fourth type that we called subcortical. And the reason we called it subcortical was because there was no consistent strong damage to the cortical areas. It was almost, it was very consistent that these patients all had subcortical damage, but the cortical parts of the brain were really not so bad. So what this would look like on a scan is they don't look like they have much atrophy anywhere. Um, and this is very interesting. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, uh, one of the really important points, in case any of you is wondering, is that these patients all had BBFTD. There was no question. They were diagnosed very carefully based on the standard research criteria, and there was no difference in overall disease progression or function. They all, in the, in the superficial sense, looked the same. They, they all had cognitive deficits. They all had behavioral deficits that were, that were in many ways similar. There was no question that these were BBFTD patients, and it wasn't just a matter of, hey, the subcorticals are earlier than the frontotemporals. It was not true. But let's start to think about this a little bit. So if the, if the two networks that we used to, to conduct this analysis were the salience network and the semantic appraisal network, what it suggests is that those networks really help discriminate different anatomic subtypes of BBFTD. But my question, since I care about social and emotional functioning so much, was, well, what is that do to help us explain the heterogeneity that we see across BBFTD patients. We expect FTD patients to really be diverse. When I'm going to sit down with a new patient, I never know what they're going to behave like. They're going to be very, very different. And do these anatomic subtypes help us? 
Well, I want to show you that when we group everybody together and we don't look like at anatomic subtypes, this is an example of the degree of heterogeneity. So in terms of the, the first year, this is also part of the paper with Camelini in JAMA Neurology, uh, Dr. Ranasinga. Uh, the percent of BVFDD patients who have personality changes in the first year, it's not 100%. Not 100% have apathy, not 100% have emotional blunting or disinhibition or obsessive behavior or altered eating habits. You can tell that there's no one symptom that is a slam dunk when you look across all BBFPD patients. There's no one core symptom. And the same is true even of the core diagnostic criteria that we use. Uh, there is not one of them that goes up to 100%. But when we start to look at these different subtypes, we, we uh, divide them up the way that I showed you, we start to get a little bit more of an interesting picture. So we start to see things like, for instance, um, this pink bar, these are semantic appraisal network or temporal variant patients, 100% of them have behavioral disinhibition. And over here, when we look at uh, the front of temporal types, 100% of them have hyperorality, even though maybe the subcortical types are much less likely to have that. Um, if we look over here, you can see that personality changes are much, much stronger early in front of temporal types and semantic appraisal types, and much less typical in frontal types. So we start to get some interesting patterns when we divide them up. And so I want to um, also show you that when we do uh, actual face-to-face -face cognitive testing of social and emotional functions, and we get uh, behavior ratings from family members. Many of you have probably participated in studies like this, and I am very grateful. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this without your input. You can see some interesting patterns. Look at this. When we look at emotion naming and sarcasm detection, sort of picking up on subtle social cues and knowing what they mean, suddenly the semantic appraisal group, there are 100% of them are impaired at that. They're really bad at that. Whereas when you look at subcortical patients, a very small proportion of them are bad at reading emotional cues and, and picking up on uh, emotions. Whereas complex social cognition, it's bad in almost everybody, but you can see that the subcorticals are a little bit better at it. They're a little better at those tests. So we start to really see divergence, and I'm going to keep unpacking this as we go along, but this helps us to understand a little more about why there are such differences. So I want to focus in for a minute on the right temporals, the folks that have the semantic appraisal network damage here, and also the front of temporals who have this temporal lobe damage. So both of them have temporal damage, and I want to, uh, to, to focus a little bit on these. If we look at the SAN subtype, uh, they are twice as likely to have obsessive compulsive behavior than any of the other subtypes within year one. A hundred percent of them are socially disinhibited and a hundred percent of them fail at emotional naming and social cue detection tests. So compared to even the other FTD patients, they are much worse at emotion. They're much worse at picking up on signals. Uh, they actually seem to uh, be more assertive actually. So this is probably because their frontal lobes are still more intact. They're, more, they're less likely to be apathetic. They're more likely to be very active. And I want to show you a video of a patient that uh, in many ways would fit into this type of, of individual who has a lot of semantic appraisal or temporal lobe damage. And this is uh, courtesy of a, uh, a wonderful documentary on uh, FTD. Okay, so you can tell that uh, this is an individual who really has 
uh, a lot of obsessive behavior. He spends hours and hours in the backyard killing ants, and he really cares about killing those ants. He counts them. He writes down the numbers. He keeps track of napkins that he's used or not used. This is, this is behavior that obviously um, is a changing in valuation of what's important and not important. We're going to talk more about that later, um, but not all FTD patients uh, behave that way. Now, another subtype that I mentioned that's very important is the subcortical subtype. We still think this is damage to the salience network. Even though the cortical parts of the salience network maybe aren't damaged, it's still explainable by the fact that a lot of subcortical regions who, that are still in the semantic appraisal network are affected. All you have to do is hit a few of these subcortical areas and the same behaviors will come out. This is why they all get diagnosed with BBFTD. Um, but the damage is really due to circuit disruption, not due to frank atrophy to the cortical parts of the brain. And when we look at the, the subtype, there's some interesting things about this. It's relatively novel. We haven't, we're really the first to describe it this way, but it really is a large proportion of FTD patients. Uh, maybe a quarter to a third of FTD patients could fit in this category. Um, 30 in our UCSF sample of 90 uh, had this, and we've done further analyses, and we show that they keep this subtype for years and years. It's not that they start this way and then become more atrophic in other areas. They really stay this way. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that they seem to have a little more connection with their emotional systems, which are still disrupted, but they report greater distress, they report greater psychopathology, more anxiety, more depression. They seem to be a little better at reading emotions and social cues than other BVFTD subtypes. Uh, and this seems to be just a, a, a little bit of a difference with the subcortical subtype. There are some, some, maybe the systems that are not atrophic, but are just disconnected, are sort of shorting in and out, so they're active and then inactive. Um, another thing that's important about this, if we look at the subset in our paper who had uh, mutations, we can see that this subcortical type, if there is a subcortical type uh, who has a mutation, they're much more likely to have a C9 mutation, which is something many of you are familiar with, pr provides, um, uh, causes TDP techno um, pathology. And if we look at the pathology distribution in this group, it is predominantly TDP, not 100%. There's one uh, subset that have tau, um, but a large proportion of them have TDP. So when somebody has a subcortical presentation, they're much more likely to have TDP in the brain. Not It's not definitive, but it's more likely. And and the other thing about this subtype is they, a subset of them seem to progress much more slowly than the other three types. Uh, even those without a genetic mutation seem to be able to stay at the same level of function for many more years. And so that's important that we can separate those patients out. So now I'm, I'm coming to the end of my first section where um, I'm speaking, but I just want to make the point that these differentially affected network, uh, these network anatomies in BBFTD lead to divergent social emotional symptoms and behavior. And I'm going to unpack that in a lot more detail in the next section, but I think we're going to open it up for questions. Great. Well, thank you very much. Actually, you've gotten us off and running, um, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, this is a really good question to start with, because you've mentioned that some of the symptoms were identified and looked at starting with year one. How do you determine year one, since patients show so many subtle symptoms before they're diagnosed? That is a great question, and we struggle with that. All of us do. Uh, what we tend to do is we have to rely on the reports of the people who are coming in with the patient. Um, we ask very careful questions about, well, have you, did you notice even 10, 15 years ago, we, we really pry into the, the distant past, did you notice they had a big change? Did they suddenly have a big depression or did they suddenly um, withdraw from a number of friendships or um, any of those sorts of symptoms that could be subtle, could be psychiatric? Did they, did they be, start to become confused when they were um, doing something major like a, a house move or something? They used to be able to organize it, but then suddenly they were completely confused and didn't know how to do it. We ask questions about all of that, and we try to determine, based on family members' answers, your answers, um, when the first symptoms happened, when the first subtle signs of network dysfunction started to happen. And we just count backwards from that, now, or forwards from that. Unfortunately, when we do these studies, the reality in BBFTD is that unlike other disorders like maybe Alzheimer's or a, a language disorder, 
BBFDD patients don't tend to get found by neurologists and brought into neurologic care for a long time. It doesn't happen early. Um, what, what we found is that it's about three years on average between first symptoms and actually seeing the doctor the first time. And so, uh, so a lot of our studies, when I'm describing the first symptoms, I'm really talking about our estimate of what, what folks described three years before their first visit to the clinic. On others, I'm saying this was at their first visit to the clinic, so it's probably three, four, even five years into the disease that they're first being seen. Thank you. Can you diagnose these subtypes without an MRI or without brain imaging? Well, we don't have a study that would definitively say we can. I think that this is an open question, and I, I honestly, um, frankly, I think every patient who is at the point where we're suspecting FTD, they ought to get a brain MRI. I'm very firm on that in terms of the way our country ought to care for these patients. I mean, I think if there's any suspicion, then go get an MRI, um, and we, we're hoping that everyone will be covered for that. Um, but frankly, as we do this research and we start to understand and unpack the nuances of behavior and social, social emotional um, sensitivity that go with each of these anatomic subtypes, we may be better and better at sitting with somebody in clinic, doing a good interview, maybe doing some bedside tests, and actually being able to tell this really seems like this might be a patient that has a lot of temporal damage, or this patient, ha you know, this person has a lot of psychiatric distress uh, and insight compared to your average FTD patient, so maybe there's a little bit less cortical damage. Um, maybe it's a more subcortical type. Um, these are things that we still have to answer, but I think that we're on track to, to be doing that. In the next couple of years, the research is going to be putting that together. Thank you. You're talking in general about this and that there's a, an intrinsic vulnerability to degeneration in some of these circuits that cause the patterns that you can see. Can you say what contributes to that vulnerability within the brain cells and brain circuits? That's a great question. There are pretty much everyone who is trying to develop the cures for BVFTD is focused on this exact question. Selective vulnerability is, is really the key to getting at the treatments for these diseases. And it's the key to finding individuals early uh, and even before symptoms start. Um, the, the frustrating thing is we're not quite there yet. Um, there are a lot of hypotheses about vulnerability. Uh, some of them involve uh, maybe there, there certainly is a chance that there are some very minute genetic differences among individuals. Um, sometimes, some folks are investigating this and asking questions like, are individuals who have certain life exposures, like if they've, had, if they've spoken a lot of languages in their life, are they protected against one of these diseases or are they at higher risk? If they had a learning disability when they were younger, if they were, um, had troubles with social connection when they were younger, does this give people a selective vulnerability where certain parts of the brain will be damaged and others and certain syndromes will appear and be more likely to appear than others. So we don't really understand yet about why certain uh, structures in the brain and certain neurons within those structures are selectively vulnerable to certain conditions, but we are actively trying to figure that out and I, I'm really excited about the progress that we're making. I think we're going to get answers to this story very soon in the next couple of years. This is a question about executive function. So where does executive function come into play? This is a term people are familiar with. And if somebody has severe executive function deficits, what does that mean in terms of the images that the neurologist might be looking at? That's a good question, too. And the, and the frank answer to that is just about everybody who has any neurodegenerative disease, um, with the exception of maybe one or two of them, everyone gets executive function deficits. Now, these are deficits where an individual becomes a little less organized, perhaps, in their head. They have a harder time paying attention to multiple uh, pieces of information at once. The amount of information they can keep in their head is smaller. Their information processing speed gets slower. Um, they are less able to exhibit what we call cognitive control. So we all have a lot of automatic uh, thoughts and a lot of automatic reactions happening um, all the time, but we suppress them because we need to behave 
normally in a in a social situation. If um, if you're working with somebody and you're you get distracted, you need to bring your attention right back. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to show a little bit about that in a minute. All of those are executive functions, and frankly, that system is probably the canary in the coal mine for one of one of the many many diseases. It's not specific to BBFTD. Um, in fact, behavioral variant FTD patients have these social and emotional deficits first, even before they have any executive deficits at all. Uh, so they will probably develop those executive deficits as the disease progresses, but some people with BBFTD go very far into their disease and they still have, they're perfectly able to keep multiple things in their mind at once and they're perfectly able to pay attention. And so uh, these executive deficits are really due to um, disconnection and damage to front of, we call frontal and parietal, frontal parietal circuits or frontal subcortical circuits, which is how the outside core of the brain speaks to the subcortical pieces of it. And unfortunately, just about any kind of damage to the brain causes these problems. So it's not very diagnostically specific. It's certainly not specific to BBFTD, um, though once people get executive deficits, it can be a real symptom uh, problem, problem symptom, where uh, it affects people's lives and it affects how family members um, interact with the patient significantly. So Kate, one last question in, in this section, and then we'll have you go on to part two. But it's related in that um, people are also aware that a lot of folks with behavioral FTD, um, we comment on their awareness, their self-awareness, or their lack of self-awareness. And that's also a phrase that hasn't shown up yet in the subtypes as you're defining them. Can you just speak to that for a minute? Yes, uh, that's certainly one of the things that, that historically I've always thought was consistent across BBFTD patients, and as I've been learning more and meeting more individuals, I realize self-awareness is variable, just like any of these other symptoms. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about awareness and, and how a particular structure in the brain mediates that in the next section, but I will say that in terms of the divergent subtypes, uh, I think that there are individuals who are more likely to be able to think about their own behavior and they're more likely to notice when they're feeling bad. Uh, I think that the, uh, there are different levels of insight, different ways to, uh, ways to understand it and define it, but when you look at the subcortical types, whom I said often have a little more emotional agitation, a little more, I'm feeling bad today, I feel unhappy about this. Uh, many, many FTD patients do not feel a lot of sadness or unhappiness or anxiety. They, they are very, actually very comfortable. And we would say that they lack self-awareness, they lack insight, they're not really paying much attention or really being bothered by negative stimuli. Whereas the ones that are being bothered by those are they're worried about their cognitive health or they're, they're thinking about um, the impact that it's having on them or their family, they have more self-awareness. And uh, we, we're hypothesizing that the subcortical types are more likely to be able to have maintained self-awareness, at least at a certain level. Um, I would say it's still reduced. I would say that as part of BBFTD, you do lose some awareness of your impact on others and some awareness of your own state. Uh, and that is just endemic across BBFTD patients. But um, I think we're learning much more about how anatomy predicts the degree of that symptom. Great, thank you. Well, let's ask you to go ahead to part two and then we'll leave more time for questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. So uh, I said before um, that we were going, we had looked at the different types of FTD syndrome and we started to unpack how the anatomy leads to the different subtypes. But what I want to do now is I want to teach a little bit more about how the brain does social and emotional functioning. And the reason I want to do this is because I think for all of the people listening, anybody here who uh, knows an FTD patient, you know that uh, every individual is different. And if you're in a, a caregiver group and there are other FTD patients that you're exposed to or you hear about, you know that your particular individual, your loved one, is going to behave differently from the loved ones you, you know, the other people you hear about, and and I think that I want you to have the tools to be able to say, ah, it seems like maybe this and this is happening in in the brain, but that's not in the person that I care about. And so, so one of the things I want to step back and think about is ask what the brain is doing when we care about something. I think even the word care is heterogeneous. I think we often think about caring between individuals. We care about what happens to them. There's a there's a maybe a 
a, a partnership or a maternal kind of caring parent-child, but there's also caring about a sports team. You know, you really, you really are invested in what happens, um, or you really maybe care about something negative, or you, you are upset about the way things are going at work and you're worried about it. It just shows that you care about your work. And we can also care about things, even things that don't matter to other people. This is the Big Lebowski. Um, he's, the entire movie centers around him loving this carpet and something bad happens the carpet gets stolen and it activates this very indolent passive gentleman into a, a series of events because he cares so much about his carpet. And so what does it mean to care? It's really divergent. And I think that I think a lot about what is empathy and I do think about caring in terms of, uh, of caring for other people. And I think it's important to note that empathy is complicated. Uh, our brains do this in a complicated way. Part of empathy is feeling with another person. And, you know, infants do this. If one baby cries, the other baby can start crying. You know, when we feel happy, um, others in the room start to feel happy with us. Even animals can do this. Anybody who has a, a dog knows that the dog is picking up on your emotions, and, and that's just the way they work. We are hardwired to feel with each other, and we, we talk about emotional contagion and mimicry. You know, our bodies sort of take on the body posture and the body um, expressions of other people around us, and that's part of empathy. Another part of empathy that's really important, though, is thinking with another. Um, this little cartoon is saying, how would you like it if the mouse did that to you? And she's speaking to her cat. Um, she's trying to get the cat to think about another person's perspective. And this is actually a lot of work. This is not hardwired. Um, this is something that we learn to do, and often our environments kind of train us to be thinking this way. It's a form of executive functioning, actually, um, to be thinking more com in a more complex way about other people, people's experience. And my point about this is that we really need both of them together to be empathic. If you have one without the other, you are not going to be able to choose the right way to interact with people. You're not going to be able to be truly empathic and enact the most helpful prosocial response. And that's true of all of us, you know, apart from disease. Uh, and I want to make the point that uh, feeling with, thinking with helps us to act for people. And I want to make the point that I think this is a key part of psychological health for all of us. I think psychological health is feeling deeply and thinking clearly at the same time. And that helps us to act effectively in our world. So the question is, are there identifiable neural circuits for these functions, for feeling deeply, for thinking clearly, um, that enable us to act effectively? And I would say there really are. And I think that I'm bringing up this very complicated uh, slide again just to point out that um, I focus my research in the center box with the red line around it and caring. Um, executive functions are over here, memory, uh, task focus are over here, but most of my work is in this box because I think that uh, the salience network and another network I've mentioned called the semantic appraisal network are key for how humans care. And if you heard the first part of my talk, you know that these two networks are also the foundational networks that get damaged in BBFTD. And I think that one of the, one of the important things is people have different degrees of damage to these two different networks and to the structures within them, and it causes differences in behavior. So, so that salience and semantic appraisal help us to feel with and think with other people. And I'm going to try to explain in a little more detail now that these functions are based on made two major activities. One of them is paying attention, and that goes with the salience network. And one of the activities is what we do with our learned experience. How do we learn about the world? How do we know how we think and feel about the world? And how do we enact that? Um, and how does it go wrong in FTD? So another key piece of this, uh, as we're talking about empathy, I want to focus on, on attention for a minute, um, and it's particularly around the salience network. When we think about the opposite of empathy, some people, you know, I, I, when I speak to audiences, they often say, oh, it's uh, hatred or anger, but, but I always have a few people who bring up the point that the opposite of empathy is lack of feeling. It's maybe ignoring the other and overlooking them. You know, if we're not feeling with them and not thinking about their experience, we can do a lot of bad things to them, or we can, we can ignore them, or we can even cause them a lot of pain. If we say they're not like me, 
at the extreme, we can even dehumanize people. And that's really the opposite of empathy. And so attention is very important in empathy. The more we look at another person, the more we think about them and feel with them. We start to, we can't help it. If we're paying attention to them, we start to take on a little bit of their experience. It's just the way we're hardwired. And the more we look, the more we learn. The more we start to understand their experience and we start to have ideas about what their experience is like. And those two things, attention and learning about experience, help us to be more empathic. And our brains are hardwired to do this. So I'm going to point out one of the things that the, the Salience Network does. Now, this is the network that helps us pay attention to what's important. The amygdala is one of the structures in that network. And many of you have heard of the amygdala before, um, but there are a lot of misconceptions about this structure. People tend to say, oh, it helps you read emotions, or it's the emotion center of the brain. This is not true. This is not real. It's an overstatement of what the amygdala is doing. Um, frankly, the amygdala is just like an alarm bell, a warning bell, that there's something important going on. And it's not only about negative information either. It can be about a lot of different aspects of information. But here's an experiment that helps you to understand a little bit more about what the amygdala is doing. Um, Ralph Adolph did this in 2005, and it's a beautiful experiment. If you look over here on the left, uh, what he did was he took emotional faces and showed them to individuals who were healthy. And he had an eye tracker on them, which means that um, he was able to see where their eyes moved when they were looking at these emotional faces. And you can see these red lines and white circles show where they focused and where, they, where their eyes moved. And on average, you can tell that when healthy people were just instructed, just look at the face, they weren't told anything to do, they just looked at the faces, you can see that the natural way to examine a face is looking at a, basically a triangle. You spend a lot of time at the eyes and spend a little bit of time down in the lower part of the face. And that's normal. And these people could all name the emotions they were seeing when they needed to. Now over on the right, we see what happens when patients who don't have amygdalas are put in the scanner. Where do they look? Nowhere valuable. <laughs> they're looking at the nose, they're looking at the middle of the face, they're not really looking at the eyes, they're not seeing anything that would really help them to determine emotions. And when you ask patients with amygdala lesions, what emotion are you seeing? They get it wrong. They, they name it wrong a lot of the time. But here's the key. If you tell someone with amygdala lesions, look at the eyes, just instruct them, look at the eyes, suddenly they read the emotions just fine. And that's the problem. That's exactly what the amygdala is doing. The amygdala is a, is a structure that hardwires us to look at what's important. And when we're looking at a face, we've learned that most of the information that's really important to us is happening at the eyes. There's also some important information around the mouth. Um, but the nose is never going to tell us how somebody feels. It's just not an important part of the face. And the amygdala lesion folks lose that hardwired ability. And so that's what the amygdala does for all of us. And as you may be familiar, certain BVFTD patients have a good amount of, of amygdala damage. Uh, and it's different across patients. I would say patients with semantic appraisal network damage have more amygdala damage. So they're less likely to pay attention to what's important um, unless they are told to do so or, or, or sort of led to do so. So another really important part of this network is the insula. And you've probably heard about the insula because it is such a key structure in behavioral variant FTD. Um, but what is it doing? Why is it so important? This is, in many studies, ground zero for FTD. This is where it seems to start. And it seems that everything else is following on the symptoms that this causes. So this is a key structure. And when we look at what it's doing in normal, healthy uh, human cognition, it seems to be central to awareness. And when I say awareness, what I mean is becoming aware, cognizant of anything that's happening. So uh, various fMRI studies always seem to find the insula at the moment where somebody says, ah, I just realized I made an error, or I just realized that time is going by, or I just realized that this bucket my hand is in is getting hot, or I just realized I saw somebody I knew in a, in a sea of strangers, uh, faces that I'm viewing. All kinds of different moments of awareness seem to track with the anterior, the frontal part of the insula right here. Uh, and what we've realized over time, and we've certainly done studies with our FTD patients uh, as well, 
uh, is that it seems to be critical for self-reflection, self-awareness. You know, we the same part of the brain lights up when people view the, a picture of themselves instead of a highly significant or highly familiar other. They're more likely to activate their, their insula when they're viewing themselves. And when in studies that we've done here at our lab, um, when we look at uh, structures that are, are different in people that fail to self-reflect and fail to be aware of their own behavior, the anterior insula is central to that. And so a lot of personal awareness and self-reflection is being done by the insula. And that's one of the reasons why your typical BVFTD patient uh, has damage to this structure or at least disconnection from it. And that means that they are less likely to be fully aware of their own behavior or aware of how their behavior is affecting others because that requires self-awareness as well. So another network, I'm bringing us back to this map because it's a, I'm, I'm going to um, delve into a little bit of a confusing feature here. Um, when we talk about the salience network, sometimes people mean really two different networks that are combined together. Um, often we talk about the salience network, people combine in another network um, that is called the task control network or the stable task control network. And this is important for BVFTD because there are a lot of BVFTD patients who have damage to both of these together. And their particular selective vulnerability hits both of these networks. But other FTD patients have more of the lower part of the network, which is down here. Um, this, this part is the lower part anatomically, and this is the upper part anatomically. And different patients have different degrees of damage. So when we look at this, I, I did a paper a few years ago comparing people who were pathologically, both, both sets of people had behavioral variant FTD. One type had cortical basal degeneration as the cause for their BBFTD syndrome. Another type had PICS disease. And again, I'm talking about the pathology in the brain was CBD or PICS. But both patient, both types of patients had the same behavior, same syndrome, BVFTD. And what we found was that the folks with the CBD pathology were less likely to have the bottom network damaged, whereas the people with the PICS disease pathology were more likely to have that. And uh, when we look at our paper that I was mentioning before, Camelini and I, um, we see that there's one type that really segregates into a frontotemporal type and another that is more purely frontal. So it doesn't have the same amount of temporal damage. And this is very similar to what we found just um, by comparing pathological groups. And so I think that what I'm, what I'm saying is that it's likely that there are different subtypes of FTD, uh, some of which really affect the dorsal networks and some don't. And uh, even when we looked with Camelini at the neuropathology, the subset of folks who, who actually had autopsy uh, tissue, uh, it looks like the frontal types, this, this dorsal type, is much more likely to be CBD so, uh, and less likely to be one of the other tau's. So it does seem like the degree to which somebody has dorsal versus ventral dysfunction can be predictive of pathology. And when, I look, uh, when we look at the different subtypes, there are some other important differences. So the, the frontal only types actually have worse motor deficits. They're, they have a lot more incoordination. They have more likely to have Parkinsonism. <clears throat> they have more likely to be, have abnormal gait. And when we look at their executive function, they're much worse at various aspects of executive function. They don't have the same cognitive control. Um, they are slower cognitively. Um, they are less able to pay attention to multiple things at once. And when we look even in the social domain, they're less assertive. They're more passive, um, even than just the ones that have frontal and temporal damage. And they are less likely to take other people's perspective when uh, they need to for empathic purposes. And so there are some very interesting sets of deficits from the frontal uh, predominant types. And it really just shows you that the balance between these networks matters. Because so, both of these types have frontal damage, but something about the balance between frontal and temporal really affects these frontal patients. I'm going to show you a video of a patient that, that really has a lot of damage to the dorsal or task control part. Uh, of uh, the networks that are affected in BBFTD. And you can't hear him very well in the beginning, or she, his doctor is talking to him, that's her, and this is the individual with FTD. And she is asking him a very important question. She's asking him, what, um, how does this disease affect you and affect your family? You can't hear her very well in the beginning, but you'll hear it once he starts speaking.
Okay, so the, the thing about this video that I want you to pay attention to is it's not the fact that he got distracted. I think any of us, this is actually a beautiful view of the Golden Gate Bridge, and so any of us would look out the window at that moment and maybe get distracted. The thing that's important about what happened with this gentleman is that he couldn't come back. He didn't come back. The task control part of the brain helps us to know, have a little thing in the back of our brain saying, wait, what were we just talking about? We're, are we done yet? Oh, my doctor just asked me a question. I better answer her. But he never had that come online. He never came back to that and said, what are we doing here? And that's because his task control network is not active. His memory was actually not terrible. It's not that he just forgot. It was that he just couldn't stay on task. And I want to point out that um, this is one phenotype of BBFTD is just a, an extreme distractibility, loss of focus, not paying attention to the thing they were focusing on before. Um, and you might notice that this gentleman has pretty good emotional functioning, right? He's, he's kind of, has normal way of expressing his emotions and, and is actually kind of humorous and funny about the way he's making his comments. And that's probably because he has a lot of, um, he doesn't have as much temporal lobe damage as some of the other FTD patients that we see. So again, this is part of the heterogeneity of the syndrome. So, uh, so that's, uh, I was talking about the task control and salience network balance. Now I'm going to move and look a little bit at semantic appraisal network in a little more detail because I've been talking about that a lot. And I want to be clear about what that network is doing. So um, we have, we were talking about these two subtypes of, uh, of FTD. One is sort of the, the standard right temporal variant that's been around for years. Um, and then this type is the front and temporal types. Both of them have a good amount of temporal lobe damage. And it seems that the parts of the temporal lobe, these lateral parts of the temporal lobe that are damaged, and a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more of the medial frontal regions that are damaged here, uh, seem to be related to a network we call the semantic appraisal network. And so what is this network doing? Um, I think the way to think about this uh, is that this network is actually handling data, hand processing information um, that is all acquired. <laughs> Though the ability to handle that information is probably innate, the information itself we learn over time. So when you're born, the information that this network handles, probably it's like empty. There's, there, we don't have any information yet. And as we go through life, we acquire uh, what we need for this network to work. One piece of that is just knowledge about the world. And so, uh, you know, do, do I, what is, uh, what's the difference between chocolate ice cream and strawberry ice cream? You know, first you have to know what ice cream is. When you're an infant, you don't. Uh, and then when you experience more of life, you have to actually try the chocolate and the strawberry, and then you know what the difference is. You know the different colors, you know the different tastes. But then the, this network also hooks together, um, not just knowing about the world, but also your evaluation of what you know. So it's not enough to say, you know, what's the difference between chocolate and strawberry? which do I like better? Do I like chocolate or do I like strawberry? And those kinds of evaluations, those likes and dislikes, are very individualized. They're based on our experience and they're based on intrinsic factors. I like chocolate better than strawberry, somebody else feels the other way, and that's totally normal. And the semantic appraisal network is what encodes all that information. It helps us in the temporal lobes uh, is where we store all that information. And you've heard probably about semantic variant patients. They have a lot of left temporal pole damage, and they lose the ideas of what things are in the world. But when the damage is on the right side, we're more likely to lose knowledge about emotions and about social concepts. And so we, you know, the anterior temporal lobes are involved in helping us know about the world. And these structures get directly damaged in BVFTD, not just semantic variant, but BVFTD, when the temporal lobes are hit and the subtypes that hit the temporal lobes, they will stop having the same information available to them. And the other thing uh, that this network does, as I said, is it helps us keep a library of what we like and dislike, our personalized evaluations. And this is much more the frontal part of the network, so this, this um, more orbitofrontal piece uh, in here, even, even a little bit posterior, and this part is actually connected with reward structures in the brain. Uh, the nucleus accumbens is, is likely part of this, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what these evaluations are doing is basically uh, they're updating all the time 
what do we like, and if the situation changes, uh, do I actually not like it as much anymore? So I'm going to have you watch a video, and this video actually does not have sound. Um, and I want you to watch the video and think about the moment uh, that you know who the patient is, who the person with BBFTD is. They're having Christmas dinner, everything's fine. Um, suddenly, someone's licking their plate, and you realize that's the patient. And I, I want to ask, why do we know that he's the patient? Why does that matter? I mean, it's his own dinner, it's his own plate, he liked his dinner. Why is licking the plate something that we all tune into and say, oh my gosh, that's not okay? Well, it's because we have uh, a very culturally mediated, individualized view of what's appropriate to do. We call it social norms. And we all have, you know, in another culture, it'd be fine to do that. But apparently, you know, in our culture, we developed the idea you're not supposed to pick up your plate and lick it. And so BVFTD patients tend to not have the sense of what these social norms are. They, don't, they at least don't behave according to the social norms. And it turns out that um, this is largely mediated by semantic appraisal network structures. Uh, it's probably both. It's a little bit of both because I think that certain patients, they just don't care. Um, and that's probably a little bit more inattention to the negative outcomes that could happen. Um, but when we look at it, it, it really does correlate with anatomy like this right temporal pole. So this semantic appraisal network anterior temporal region helps us keep a hold of what the rules are and helps us access that. And when our BVFDD patients lose those rules and just don't even know what they are anymore, they're so much less likely to pay attention to them. And the gentleman in the video licking his plate did have a lot of semantic appraisal network damage. So here's another video. And again, it doesn't have sound, but this time I want you to watch it and try to figure out what this person is feeling. And I know there's no sound, so it makes it a little bit harder to tell how she's feeling. But when you watch her face and you watch the way she's moving, you start to get the idea that she is sad. And when you're watching a video like that where it's a little bit ambiguous, it's not clear necessarily from the beginning, maybe some of you took a couple seconds or, or even the whole video to figure out what she's feeling, um, you are probably covertly, very, very quietly without even realizing it, making some of the faces. Like when I watch an audience that I, you know, who are watching this video, I look out at them and they're often getting a sad face. They're sort of raising their eyebrows in the middle and they're, um, they're doing some very specific sad movements with their face. And we do that all the time. Every individual, when you look at an emotion, your face automatically contracts muscles that are matching that emotion. Uh, even if you don't even realize you're seeing the face, there have been plenty of, emo plenty of emotion experiments like this that show that we actually use those muscles to help um, mimic that face and embody and simulate that face in front of us. And when we're stopped from doing it, like if you, in an experiment, if you have uh, individuals put a pencil in their mouths and they don't even know why you're having them hold a pencil, you're not telling them that you're measuring their emotion, their, um, their muscles or their ability to read emotions. They won't do as good a job at recognizing the emotion if they can't simulate it. They actually will be a little bit worse at recognizing it. And this is partly because when we simulate another person's emotion, it intensifies our experience of the emotion. And there's even, there's even a little bit of research that says when you get Botox injections that actually reduce the facial responsiveness, so you can't mimic the other, you can't use those muscle groups and mimic the emotions you're seeing, it actually, there's suggestion that your amygdala doesn't light up quite the same way, and your subjective description of your emotional experience is a little bit more muted. So that's a, a very important thing to be aware of. We need our full facial motion, wrinkles and all, uh, to embody and simulate emotions. And I think that the semantic appraisal network is helping us do this. Um, but I think it's a little bit of both. So when we read emotions, like say we had, this is a study where we had patients read those videos. Um, when their sound is on, we use a lot of temporal lobe, a lot of this medial frontal lobe. It's very much the semantic appraisal network. When we turn off the sound and make it really hard, the patients who do well still are the ones with intact uh, reward structures. This nucleus accumbens piece here 
uh, nucleus accumbens is a structure that's directly related to being sensitive to reward. So for some people, doing these tasks, reading these emotions, being aware of and attentive to emotions is rewarding. And when we lose the capacity to be rewarded by that, we stop doing it. And again, a lot of BVFTD patients, this is the case with them. You know, for, for them to care about something, the way the brain handles caring, the nucleus accumbens is very important. What is emotional to us is Im important. And what is important becomes about us. Anything that's important to us, we start to personalize, and that makes us more emotional. So these are all interlinked in a way that it's very hard to disentangle in the brain. This is the same thing, and that's what caring is. And so reward is very big a part of that. So I'm going to show one last video of a gentleman for whom it's clear that he has issues with both the salience and semantic appraisal network. Um, and this is an individual who is a typical BBFTD type person uh, having difficulties with empathy. Um, he's talking to his, uh, his mother about how he treats their dog at home. When Max barks, do you sometimes squeeze him or um, put, put him between your legs and squeeze him? You know, it's so that, that he squeezes and he squeezes. Sometimes he squeals, right? Because you're hurting him, okay? And so I'm wondering, are you doing that because you're angry with him? Or are you doing that because you're trying to get him to stop? I try to get him to stop. Yeah. Barking. Uh -huh. Do you think there could be another way you could do that? You know, by just talk, like sometimes you just talk to him and he does stop, you know. Um, but you keep doing it that way. This is something that you and I have had a, had a, an issue with. Um, um, do you think you could just talk to him and not squeeze him so that he squeals? Do you think you could do that? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh -huh. Do you know that you sometimes hurt him? When you do some of those things, do you know that that hurts him? I don't believe he hurts. Oh, you don't think he hurts? You think this, what do you think he's squealing for when he squeals, when you do that? You don't know. Okay. So, so this is somewhat heartbreaking here because he's really not able to even imagine his, his semantic system, even when his partner, his, his mother actually, is telling him the dog is squealing, that is a sign of pain, the dog is hurting, he can't really put those pieces together because that requires a lot of anterior temporal lobe to put those pieces together. He's not able to embody the experience of the dog and he's just not able to pay attention to it. So it's the loss of attention and knowledge here that leads to a lack of empathy. And so when we look at structurally uh, in the brain, this is exactly what we see. When we look at ratings of real life BBFTD patients level of empathy, we see that it relies on both the salience network and semantic network, appraisal network. And the two of these together help us to have a higher level of feeling deeply and thinking clearly in order to behave empathically. So uh, I, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, I, I just want to leave you with the idea that these differences in anatomy across the BVFTD patients really lead to differences in behavior. And every single FTD patient is a little bit different from the other ones. Um, and I want to thank all the, the PIs that I collaborate with for this research. I want to thank my current um, lab members and affiliates. And, and I really want to thank the families and patients who have made this kind of research possible. We could not do any of this work without your help. So thank you very much. And now we're going to go on to question and answer session number two. Great. Thank you, Kate. For, it's a really um, very interesting and a challenging presentation, I think, for folks who've been, many of the people joining us today are people who've been living with um, someone with this diagnosis or maybe even themselves or working with folks. And so being able to kind of drill down and begin to understand how 
you as researchers are teasing apart the different types of FTD is just really wonderful and I, I think really captures a lot of people's interest and imagination. And this will be no surprise to you, but it also then stimulates the challenge of saying, let's take this information and apply it. Um, and so a lot of the questions that we have coming in are things that are asking to kind of help us to apply some of what you're learning in different areas. And I think the first, as I've been looking at them, I'm trying to, to group them um, in order to feed them back to you. And I think maybe we start with diagnosis. So we've had a number of people ask about um, how does this information that you're learning about um, teasing apart the circuits involved and the types of symptoms that correlate with them, how does that influence diagnosis? Um, the role of imaging, of course, in diagnosis is really something that people encounter a lot. Um, often people are told, well, well, gee, the PET scan maybe isn't definitive. Um, it's possible FTD, and um, it seems like you're able to get a whole lot more information out of some of these scans than maybe the folks who are going for diagnostic evaluations at the community level. Can you just speak to a little bit about that? Um, is there, how does the information that you're learning in these studies apply to the process of getting a diagnosis um, and the information available to people at that point in time? That's a great question. This is a huge concern of mine. I, I think this is a place where I'm very emotionally invested in diagnosis and in improving diagnosis of these patients in the community uh, and educating docs as best I can, educating families. And I, I feel like, I think there probably is a little frustration out there. I know I share it about the diagnostic process in these diseases. And, and one, of the, one of the issues is early detection. And another issue is accurate identification of what exactly is the syndrome and, and what exactly is the pathology that's causing the syndrome, particularly when we get to the point where we have particular disease-modifying treatments that, that uh, directly impact the proteins in the brain, which we're on our way to having those treatments, it's going to become really, really important that we, that we identify patients early and that we are able to tell which disease we're looking at. Um, and, and a lot of times what we do right now um, is a very complicated multifactorial process because we sadly, there's no blood test and there's no definitive imaging test that will tell us which pathology is causing the syndrome we're looking at. Instead, we look at how the patient behaves. We look at um, their behavior, we look at their cognition, we look at their how they move, their motor um, uh, activity. Um, we obviously ask a lot of questions about what their life looks like, and we look for changes. And we try to determine how much of this is a new problem, which suggests a neurologic or neurodegenerative uh, condition, and how much of this is just that lifelong they weren't very empathic. Because a lot of these issues, sadly, um, particularly in my field in social and emotional functioning, there's a whole range of people's social sensitivity. Some people just are, are out there, you know, holding down a job. There's no dementia involved, but they're just not good at reading emotions, or they're just not very empathic. Uh, and these are these are the realities of the individuals, you know, we're dealing with. We have to know that we're talking about a change, and that helps us say, ah, maybe this is neurologic. Maybe this is BBFTD. And so we as clinicians have a very complicated way of diagnosing. We have to really understand the whole person in order to come to a diagnosis. Now, the way that these, the information I'm giving you today about the subtyping can influence that, um, I believe that it's, it's valuable because it helps the more specific we can see the this, this different subtypes and the different syndromes. Like if we start to lump every syndrome together, then they all look the same and they all look different, and it's really not helpful diagnostically. The more we can come up with clean, biologically derived, um, biologically appearing subtypes that basically are, there's some kind of cause for why certain patients get a semantic appraisal network damage type and other patients get a subcortical type. We don't understand the causes yet, but once we separate those people out, that helps us study them better, um, and it'll help us to I come up with the tools to identify them, either on imaging or with behavior. One of the things that I do 
that's directly relative, relevant to this that I really want to see happen in the community, I develop social and emotional tests and I'm, I'm working on linking those tests with brain signatures. So, for instance, I have a test that I give, it's just a questionnaire, 11 items, not a big deal, a caregiver would fill it out about the patient um, at a regular doctor's visit. And But the scores on this questionnaire are, so, and I have a couple of these different ones, but they're so well keyed to semantic appraisal network or um, salience network function um, that we can actually say that with a low score on this test, this questionnaire, you have poor semantic appraisal or salience network function. Sorry, I'm saying both. I really mean salience network. Um, even I, I get them mixed up. They're a mouthful. Um, salience network function. And so, um, so by giving a questionnaire, even without the costly imaging, even if the imaging isn't available, we might be able to pick up on these people early. And we, you know, in a, in a very cost-efficient way, um, and get them farther down the road towards diagnosis. And I think that my goal, I'm, being, I'm a neuropsychologist, so I care about measuring cognition. I want to measure social behavior and measure cognition in a cheap and easy way, and make that uh, ubiquitous. I really want uh, any primary care doctor to have those tools at their disposal to try to pick up on the fact that there's something going wrong and try to zero in on what it is. So, um, so I think we just, we're, we're on the way. Um, I think we researchers and clinical researchers really care about this issue because um, we want to try to affect people's lives in a positive way. And I think the lack of clarity about diagnosis and how difficult it is to get an accurate diagnosis early um, is a major obstacle in our field. So just following up on something you had mentioned in terms of the lack of medications at this point, are there any differences in approaches to treatment that the work that you're doing points to at this point in time, or is that all still down the road? Well, I really think uh, what this work points to is differences in behavioral uh, syndrome in the sense that the, the cluster of behaviors that one family is dealing with is completely different from the cluster of behaviors that another family is dealing with. And being able to, to get out ahead of that, see that clearly, um, and know what the natural progression of the symptoms in, in group A versus group B are um, is really, really helpful in terms of management and being prepared. I think prognosis is a part of what we need to do well as clinicians. I think being able to say, yes, this year, today, um, this particular individual um, is showing some difficulty reading emotions and maybe having a little bit of difficulty expressing their emotions. Um, in a year or two, you may see them become much, much worse at this, and or they might actually, um, you might need to think about the fact that they will not be able to be um, involved in the same kinds of uh, social settings, or they might need management in social settings, um, whereas another patient becomes very, very apathetic, um, and over time, it's, it's okay to take them to a social setting. They're not going to interfere with or be disinhibited in that social setting. And I think being able to predict what's going to happen, predict how the progression is going to affect not only the patient but also the family, and be prepared for that is a really important um, thing that we can do. Um, I think these, these symptom differences do point to differences in pathology, which will eventually point to different treatments once we have a pharmacological treatment. Um, but in the meantime, it really points to better care. I think knowing this today helps people to have um, better intervention. And, and uh, some of the, the very specific symptom management approaches, like if somebody has um, a very disinhibited behavior or say they have very obsessive behavior, um, sometimes a serotonergic agent can reduce that. Um, if somebody's expressing a lot of um, kind of agitation or anxiety, like maybe uh, somebody who still has a little bit of um, intact emotion system, then a serotonergic agent can actually help them, um, whereas other patients don't need that. And so I think knowing clearly and seeing every single individual for who they are and what their symptoms are um, really impacts uh, care in a good way. So in, in some of those cases, then, there are medications that are used to target the particular symptoms that can be identified, which may be one of the things that can be teased out as, as doctors and, and family members become more aware of kind of the differences within the behavioral presentation. In terms of progression, are you saying that uh, within these subtypes, 
the disease tends to progress along the same patterns and the same circuits so that there is a fairly or there is um, that it's possible to to predict the types of symptoms that might emerge next? Yes, I am saying exactly that. I think uh, after we discovered these subtypes, uh, Dr. Manasinga and I have been working on a new analysis incorporating longitudinal data. Basically, anybody who's been, been kind enough to come in to UCSF and, and see us many times and bring their family member many times uh, to get a brain scan. Um, we have about uh, almost 90 of, of those individuals, and we're able to see that these syndromes are predictable. Uh, the progression within the syndrome is predictable and it differs across the different clusters. Different regions uh, get um, impaired along the way uh, in one group than in another group. And based on which regions are changing, we can predict what the behaviors are going to be. And so, yes, that is something. We're, we're still working on the details of, of how to do that. We don't have um, any, any major nuggets uh, that we can give on that, but I think that they're, they're forthcoming. And there's, again, if I understood correctly, you're saying that there is also overlap between the salience network symptoms and the semantic appraisal symptoms in terms of how they work together. So does that, is it possible then to see how together the disease progresses? Or is yes. it really one network and another? Well, it's definitely, for a lot of patients, they have both networks degenerating at the same time. Uh, others have one than the other and others have the reverse. So this interplay between salience network and semantic appraisal network is a really key question. And I think that we've been looking cross-sectionally a lot. A lot of our work is trying to figure out um, at one time point, what, how do the symptoms match the brain? And I think now we're moving much more into this longitudinal picture, sort of over time, what are these changes? What are the different paths of change of behavior? And how do these networks change? This is, this is a, a key issue in my lab right now, is understanding exactly what the interplay is between salience network and semantic appraisal. What does each one contribute separately to behavior? And how do they work together uh, to create behavior? So that, that's our plan. And are there things within that that allow you to understand better what determines the rate of the progression? Well, frankly, I think that the rate of progression is a factor of most likely the neuropathology underlying um, the damage to the brain. So the same structure in the brain, say the amygdala or the, the insula, can be damaged by multiple different pathologies, TDP, tau, um, all different types. And I think that we're learning about progression rates um, with the different pathologies. Um, obviously, any TDP pathology that also has um, is combined with ALS moves much faster. Uh, it seems like uh, some TDPs move very slowly. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, and so I, I think that we are not at the point where we have that precision, where uh, we look at a behavior in a person and we know um, the rate of progression. Um, but I really, I, I know that my colleagues and I want to get there and we're actively pursuing that question. Great, thanks. Um, a question about aggressive behavior. So can you speak to um, where aggressive behavior falls within the analysis that you've done and if there's ways to help families understand or predict or anticipate that as a particular symptom in the picture they're dealing with? Yeah. Uh, I think that the most important thing to think about with aggressive behavior or any, any behavior that's a problem is to look very carefully at the individual and look at what is happening. And we, we're trained, uh, we psychologists are trained uh, to look at um, the ABCs. Uh, if you haven't heard that before, the, the A is for antecedent. What happened before the behavior started? Uh, the B is the behavior itself. What exactly are they doing? You know, what, when you're saying aggression, it can be many, many different things. Maybe they're just agitated and thrashing out um, and as, a, as opposed to being actively belittling or hostile or angry at an individual. It can be very, very different. Uh, aggression can look very, very different. And then the C is the consequences. When they behave that way, what happens next? Are they accomplishing something that they need uh, with that behavior? And I think, so, so 
aggression is not a one-size-fits-all behavior. It is a very, very complex. There are many different parts of the brain, many different reasons, many different motivations, and I think that any individual deserves a look at all those elements to determine what's happening. Um, I think that it uh, sadly uh, is handled badly in some, uh, some organizations. Aggression can just be um, handled by muting the, the behavior altogether. Like, let's just, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on the doctor. Um, some doctors are very thoughtful about it, but I, I think sometimes we see patients who are, um, who are uh, sedated a little overly, um, and yet there was a, a clear reason for the behavior. For instance, um, if, a, if a person has a memory problem or a semantic um, loss, and uh, they're in a home, say like a, a care home, and they don't remember their caregivers very well, and um, they're aggressive at bath time, you know, they're constantly like battling and kicking and biting at bath time. When you look at it more carefully, maybe one individual their experience of bath time is a stranger walks into my room and starts taking off my clothes. If any one of us had that experience, we would probably bite and kick too. We would be very unhappy with that and we would fight it and be aggressive because we don't understand the context of what's happening. And so one way of handling and managing aggression is just to get into the patient's head, understand what they're seeing and what they understand about the situation, what they don't understand, and try to get out ahead of that and, and move with them through it. Um, and so that's, and I, with BPFTD, we do see aggression, but it's not a primary symptom. I think there's usually another reason why um, they are behaving in a way that's aggressive. Uh, so that's, it's, it's not a perfect answer. There's not a perfect solution for this. Um, but I think seeing every individual separately is the start. And I think we have two more questions, at least, that are pending right now. So one is about um, the role of trauma in causing the onset of FTD. And the example given is a MRSA infection that caused inflammation. It, does that have a role in either starting or speeding up the onset of FTD? That's a very interesting question. I think I have not personally heard of a MRSA infection causing FTD before, but I will say that the brain is a delicate organ, and we do not understand even there's a, there's a lot more that we need to understand about the way that certain neurons become selectively vulnerable. Uh, any infectious condition causes inflammation, and it causes uh, a, a number of very carefully balanced systems in the brain for, uh, for clearing toxins and for uh, managing functions to be changed. And so an infection could be uh, the start of something bad, though I think that we also have a lot of evidence that people go through a MRSA infection or various other kinds of infections without developing a neurodegenerative disease. There could be a lot of important genetic uh, metabolic differences among individuals that uh, lead to the selective vulnerability that we're talking about. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't write that off entirely, that um, an infection could be the harbinger uh, for a new uh, new onset neurodegeneration, just because the system could get so overbalanced, it can no longer clear the toxins, and and we start to have a buildup of pathology. We are still not really understanding that very well, but I think that uh, in the next five years, we're going to hear a lot about how inflammation and infection is related to these diseases. Great, thank you, and so actually I lied. Two more questions. One is around repeat MRIs, and the other is going to bring us back to awareness. So in terms of repeat MRIs, so once somebody's diagnosed with FTD, um, do you recommend, do you find it helpful to have periodic MRIs? Again, more at the community level probably than the research level, um, and if so, why or why not? Well, frankly, I, I think, sadly, because our, in our healthcare system, MRIs are, are extraordinarily expensive. Um, I think that we we do want to maintain costs and and not be you know burdensome. Uh, but I, I think, frankly, from a clinical research perspective, getting one good MRI early can be very very valuable. There is a law of diminishing returns for getting more. I mean, if you know what the disorder is, if you have a good sense of the particular subtype and you know what the structures are that are affected, getting additional MRIs can confirm your hypothesis 
from the first MRI, which is helpful, but modestly so. Um, and additional MRIs can also con confirm the, uh, the progression is as you suspect. Say you're seeing X, Y, and Z behaviors that are new onset. You can look and say, hey, yeah, the brain is damaged in those areas that, that fits or that doesn't fit. Um, it's not so helpful uh, that it would be something that I would expect every single patient to get, nor would I even recommend it for every patient uh, to have longitudinal MRIs. And that's predicated on feeling like you have a good one in the beginning. And there was yes. a question earlier on about the radiologist who's reading those and um, how um, important is it that those MRI scans are being read by someone with extensive experience in FTD versus the training that, again, a, a community neurologist would have? or a community radiologist would have? Well, I think that, you know, our experience of, of MRI reads in dementia, there are really two professionals doing it normally, uh, and I think that's really the best way. I think what a radiologist does is they look at a brain scan and they're mostly ruling out bad things. They're saying, this is, you know, I don't see a brain tumor. I don't see a Chiari malformation. I don't see uh, any evidence of a, of a particular kind of um, encephalomalacia. Uh, they're basically saying, here are all the things that would rule out dementia or would lead you to out, down a different path than dementia, and that's really their specialization. And should, every brain scan should be read by a uh, radiologist who's capable of doing that. Ideally, the radiologist would also be able to look for dementia-specific signs, like, oh, there's a lot of limbic atrophy, medial temporal atrophy, this could be a problem. Um, but there's a second piece to reading, and we don't, the radiologist does not typically read it the way that a neurologist would. A neurologist is looking at diagnoses of inclusion from the scan. They're not, they're, they've already had the radiologist tell them it's not a brain tumor. They're looking at the scan and they're saying, which syndrome is this? Or if they're looking at a patient who they're sure is FTD based on their behavior, they're saying, well, which subtypes is this? Do they have a lot of temporal damage? Do they have, you know, a, a, do we predict they're going to have a lot of emotion deficits or not? Um, where, what is this exactly? And I think that even among experts, that is very hard to do by eyeballing the scan. Um, a lot of the work that I actually do, um, I'm doing a lot of implementation science nowadays around imaging. We have ways to quantify an, an image. We do this in research all the time. We compare that individual's brain scan with uh, hundreds, even thousands of other individuals, and we come up with, hey, these are the parts of the brain. This is a map of the parts of the brain that are atrophic. And we can use that information to help with diagnosis. And I think that, frankly, you're even, even your average neurologist, who often works below the neck, can't necessarily look at a scan and immediately eyeball it and understand that it's FTD versus another disorder. And certainly, primary care docs can't do that. And so we need to give them the quantification that they need and bring that to the bedside, bring that to their clinic visit so they can look at that scan on their uh, electronic medical record computer and see the atrophy pattern and see an interpretation of what that might mean, a prediction of what that pathology is. And, and I think that's the thing we're trying very hard to work on in order to improve the system in the real world. Well, that would be great. And here's the last question for the day and the last one bringing us back to the question of empathy and awareness. Um, is it possible for somebody to be aware that they don't care about something and that they're losing their ability to have empathy? That's a very interesting question. I think a lot about the overlap between empathy and self-awareness. And I think that, um, I think if we think about empathy versus apathy, then we can understand this a little bit better. So I do believe it's possible for somebody to look at themselves and say, wow, I just don't care about this the way that I should, or I know that person's upset, but I'm not feeling much for them right now, or I don't care. And I think that in some ways, what we're talking about is that you're feeling some apathy, and you have self-awareness of the apathy. Uh, you're just disconnected, or you're just not invested, and that's pretty normal, actually. A lot of us get, to, to some degree, a little bit of that going on, and it's perfectly possible in the brain to have awareness of apathy. I think when you're talking about true empathy, uh, the ability to uh, 
really pick the right thing to say, to, to on a deep level understand the nuances of what somebody's communicating, even if they're not saying it, even if it's uh, reading a nonverbal signal and making extrapolations from that, that is a very high level human behavior. That is one of the most important and most complicated things that we do. And frustratingly enough, the parts of our brain that help us understand ourselves accurately and really gauge where our emotions are and how we're thinking and really see our own thought processes are very overlapping with our ability to do that for another person. We often project our own self-experience onto another person to understand them. And every time I've looked at this, and I've done quite a few papers on, on self, you know, self-awareness and self-evaluation, the structures are very overlapping. And a lot of them are actually in the temporal lobe. Uh, that is a very important part of the brain for um, thinking about your own emotions and thinking about other people's emotions um, in a more higher order uh, way. And so I do believe that it would be very hard. And all my measures say everybody thinks they're very good at social behavior. They all think they have great empathy. Even healthy people say, yeah, my empathy is good. My ability to read social signals is good. And the people who have very poor actual ability also say that they're good. So I think that there's a lack of awareness that goes along with lack of ability in that area. Thank you. And so that is the end of our presentation today. I want to thank you very much, Kate, for being with us today. And thank everyone for joining us today. We hope that you found it this has... presentation to be helpful and to, that, that we look forward to sharing more FTD webinars with folks in the future. Um, just a reminder, we thank have... Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Thanks. It's great to have had you with us. Yes. Um, and just a quick reminder for folks that we did record this webinar um, for those who aren't able to join us or if you want to share it with someone soon. Um, it will be available on our YouTube channel. We'll send a link out um, to anyone who's on our mailing list. And then please always let us know um, at our helpline contact if you have any comments or questions about the presentation and other suggestions for topics moving forward in our webinar series. So until next time, thank you again, Dr. Rankin, and thank you all for joining us. We wish everyone thank a good summer. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.